Hello, welcome to our first Sodexo Grant Info session, and thanks for your interest in starting a Campus Kitchen and participating in our upcoming Launch Grant video competition. My name is Olivia Regine, and I am the Community Development Coordinator at the Campus Kitchens Project, and I also have my colleague Matt Schnarr here, our Expansion and Partnerships Manager. So here's a brief overview of our agenda today. First, I'll give an overview of the planning process and some general helpful tips. And then Matt will move on to more specific details about the upcoming grant competition and how you can all work towards qualifying. All right, so as many of you may know, food waste and hunger are major issues across America. It is seen in many different types of communities, both urban and rural, and as many different faces. It's undoubtedly something that your community faces, and I'm sure you've probably heard these statistics you see here, that one out of every six Americans and one out of every five children don't know where their next meal is coming from. And that actually adds up to about 50 million Americans living in food insecure households. But not only are millions of people experiencing hunger across our nation, but also wasting food. So 40% of the food in the U.S. is actually wasted each year, and these are the statistics that the Campus Kitchens Project is seeking to combat. So just a general overview about who we are and what we do at CKP. Our mission is to empower student leaders to create innovative and sustainable solutions to, uh, to hunger. So we do so, so through building on existing assets. For example, recovering food that would have gone to waste, utilizing students dedicated to service, and maximizing the usage of dining hall space after hours. But we also know that we can't end hunger with food alone, and that's why our campus kitchens are going beyond the meal to develop programs that are addressing the underlying root causes. In the process, we're also developing student leaders and equipping them with the leadership skills that they'll take to their future careers. So CKP was founded in 2001, um, so clearly we have ample experience and have developed the best practices in the field during that time. Though we are headquartered in uh, DC, we also have 50 affiliate schools across the country. And those affiliate schools have recovered 6.4 million pounds of food to date and have served 3 million meals. But our network is constantly growing each semester through our launch grant video competition, which you'll learn a little bit more about today. So there are over 4,000 colleges and universities across the country. Um, not only are there motivated students at these schools, but also unused space, food, and knowledgeable communities. At CKP, we believe in asset-based development, which essentially means that these are all already existing assets that can be built on and used for the development of our program. So although every campus kitchen operates differently, our model has three essential components and that is what every campus kitchen has in common. So those are students that recover food that would have otherwise gone to waste, students preparing meals in dining hall kitchens, and students delivering those meals to those in need in the community. So the first step you see, um, this is a crucial aspect um, as food would have otherwise gone to waste, um, but this recovery could have could recur at a variety of locations. For example, some of our affiliate schools recover in their dining halls, local restaurants, grocery stores, or even farmer's markets. The next component of our model is preparing meals. So some campus kitchens reheat and repurpose food to create well-balanced and nutritious meals, while others scratch cook. And that really all depends on the type of product that every school recovers. And then lastly, students volunteer their time to deliver these meals to individuals or agencies in the community. But we have recognized that we'll never feed our way out of hunger with food alone, and that's why we encourage all of our schools to go beyond the meal and really get to the root causes of these issues rather than perpetuating the cycle of poverty and hunger. So as you can see, there's four core uh, components of how our campus kitchens go beyond the meal, and that's nutrition education, community gardens and farms, economic empowerment, and community development. Um, and just to elaborate a little bit more on those, so with nutrition education, one of the ways campus kitchens go beyond the meal, um, these programs include SNAP outreach, farmers markets and classes on nutrition and or cooking even, and we even provide curriculums to our schools on healthy eating on a budget and garden-based education for youth. 
So going on to community gardens and farms, some of our campus kitchens also partner with community gardens and farms or even create their own. And this is a great way to increase fresh produce and meals, connect partners with students, and is even used as a platform for nutrition education and positive interactions. Economic empowerment, um, that's another way that our campus kitchens go beyond the meal. Um, and some examples of this is culinary job training, on-campus farmers markets, and the creation of food hubs. So lastly, community development projects are also a way schools go beyond the meal. And these can include senior wellness classes, intergenerational service projects, or even after-school programs, backpack programs, and community dinners. There's really a wide array of um, examples of community development. And these are all projects that build connections in the community. All right, so going on to some general planning tips and expectations. As some of you may know by now, the planning process can be pretty unpredictable. Often it is non-linear and easily adaptable to fit the needs of every campus and community. For example, some of our campus kitchens are very large operations, while others may only operate once a month. Um, and what every campus kitchen looks like completely depends on the capacity and the need. So even though a ca each campus kitchen may operate differently, they all have a few commonalities, which I covered earlier, um, being that they recover food that would have gone to waste, repurpose that food into well-balanced meal meals for those in need, and go beyond the meal to address the root causes of food insecurity in the community. So here are some tips to gain support necessary to start a sustainable campus kitchen. First and foremost, having a team that's dedicated to the process is really important, as well as delegating tasks to team members and setting a timeline. Um, we also have a great planning tool that allows you to collaborate with your team members and CKP national staff, such as myself and Matt. And I highly recommend utilizing this resource to keep your planning team organized and on task. So also be persistent. You may run into people along the way that are hard to reach initially or hesitant to support a campus kitchen. And a lot of this is about relationship building. So foster those connections. And if one person says no, you know, don't give up. OK, so on to those four components that I mentioned earlier um, needed to start every campus kitchen. So although our model can be tailored specifically to each school and each community, the four things, um, the four components that are important to gain support are school support, dining support, uh, student support, and community support. And I'll be elaborating on that now. So um, getting your school support can oftentimes be daunting, but having a vast support on campus makes the process go that much more quickly and smoothly. So campus support is crucial to a successful campus kitchen, and that's obviously why it's important. Um, but we really want full buy-in from the administration so the program remains intact despite students and coming and going after, year after year. Um, so what is a sponsoring office? Each campus kitchen uh, needs what we call is a sponsoring office, which is a place that the campus kitchen essentially calls home, because we want the campus kitchen to be sustainable and deeply rooted in the community, not just a floating entity. So this usually can fall on an office of service, student leadership, civic engagement, campus ministry, for example. But it can also be an academic department, such as um, social change, nutrition, culinary arts, business, et cetera. Um, some schools are also, also start their program through a class or use their professor as their sponsor. Um, and they are going to be the first group you need to reach out to. And they can usually help connect you with other students and programs and staff that might be interested in starting this project. So what is their role? The sponsoring office can provide a range of support. And this may mean providing office space or simply oversee, overseeing campus kitchen operations and volunteer base. Um, but aside from having a sponsoring office, fostering a variety of support of other staff and admin on campus can only be to your benefit. Talking with your president, provost, dean of students, and getting them on board can help foster more support. And this also might be a good place to start if you have a relationship with anyone in higher administration. So talk to your professors and other staff members. And don't limit yourself to departments that might just have you know, more tie into hunger and food, because you really never know who might be interested. 
So how to pitch it to the school. Um, being a part of an elite network is not only about name recognition, but it's also about sharing the knowledge and best practices that I mentioned earlier. So we've been around for a while, and our affiliate schools have proven to benefit from the vast network through collaboration. Um, another component of how to pitch this is students serving the community. So campus kitchens are the best way to connect the college and the community on a consistent basis. Um, and that typically leads to a deeper understanding of community needs. Um, the community is really the best form of a classroom, and service learning experiences provide such valuable hands-on experiences that you just really can't find within the confined walls of a college class. Our students gain a really deeper understanding of their community and the unique needs of their community through interaction and service. And that service really has developed student leaders. So when you're part of a campus kitchen, you're essentially running your own nonprofit on campus. You report to us, you can apply for subgrants and even manage a budget. Um, but beyond these tangible skills, you'll gain valuable leadership skills that you can take with you onto your future career. So gaining support from your school continued. Um, value. So a campus kitchen is deeply rooted um, in the campus community. So there's not only campus ownership, but the value of community ownership is uh, just as important. And we want to see full buy-in from the top down, because when everyone's on board, that's when a campus kitchen thrives. And that's why the planning process can be lengthy, but once it's complete, the campus kitchen is there to stay. And that's why all of our campus kitchens that have launched still exist today. So a next step would just be to reach out to a potential office, you know, potentially your service uh, engagement office or a campus ministry, and really talk to the key individuals that might be able to help you. Um, and it can be a challenge identifying the right people to contact because sometimes the red tape on college campuses can be very difficult to navigate, but don't give up. As I said earlier, persistence is key. Um, if you're having trouble finding the right person to contact, ask for referrals and advice from those who do support you in your mission. Um, working with administration and legal, this is something we can help you with, but it is often a challenge in this area. Um, because often when administration and legal teams speak different languages, and that's something you know we're we're here for, and we can help you with. So don't worry about that. Um, and establishing a sponsoring office is sometimes difficult because every college campus is different. Sometimes the nutrition department is a better fit for your campus kitchen as opposed to the service learning office. So if one falls through, you always have more options. Okay, moving on to dining support. Dining services is an integral part of any campus kitchen, and the better relationship you have with your dining service provider, the more easily your campus kitchen will run, though there are many other ways um, a campus kitchen can run successfully if dining services is not fully on board. But w if we're looking for an ideal partnership, that would include food recovery, space, training, and support. Um, in the ideal situation, students will be able to recover food from the dining hall and on campus um, on a regular basis. And a campus kitchen also needs space to bring their recovered food and prepare it. So hopefully dining services is able to provide this. Sometimes even like a shelf or walk-in cooler or empty table can do. Um, so some dining staff have even in the past provided knife trainings or further support for our student volunteers and that's what we like to see. So how to pitch it to dining. Um, all these resources are also available on that online planner that I mentioned. But food waste and hunger um, are problems that we can work together on. So when pitching this project to dining, ensure that you know, you're not pointing any fingers because I think it's easy for dining to feel as if they're being blamed for an issue rather than part of an issue. And that's why I think it's pr easy to present a campus kitchen as something we can work together on to address the issue of food waste. So the financial component. Um, often when dining services companies uh, stre are stressed about reducing waste because food, is off food waste is also money. Um, so try to pitch campus kitchens through not only a waste reduction lens, but through a financial lens of saving money. Um, the environmental component as well. We all know food waste contributes greatly to climate change and environmental de degradation. Um, this is a great point when talking to certain dining services companies to stress local food sourcing. Um, and if some companies have branded themselves on it being environmentally conscious as well. Um, furthermore, 
As I previously mentioned, liability tends to be dining's primary concern, so when pitching this initiative, be sure to stress that we require our students to be ServSafe certified, as well as use HACCP, which is a food safety tracking paperwork. And this allows us to ensure that all donated food that's being is being handled in a safe manner that follows the guidelines that dining does as well. Okay. So continued, um, there's some value in this as well. So there's benefits um, of becoming a campus kitchen for dining, and one of those is a tax write-off for a service provider. Um, there's even an enhanced tax deduction for food donations up to 1.5 times the cost of food, um, but also tracking consumption. So there's a potential to save money for a food service provider. Um, dining isn't always sure as to what food is being wasted more than other food, and I think this creates a really unique opportunity for campus kitchens to provide them a service um, and track which food is wasted so they know what product to buy less or more of. And this way, um, dining could perceive a campus kitchen as an actual asset. Um, so first and foremost, the next step would be to identify your dining service director or general manager and set up a meeting with them or potentially, you know, walk into their office if they aren't responding to emails, which is, you know, typical, um, and once again, persistence is key. Um, but some challenges in this area that you might run into, liability concerns that I mentioned earlier. Um, dining is usually concerned with this, but it's important to address that there's an act that keeps, ensures that we are not liable, nor is dining liable for donating food in good faith, and that's the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. Um, limited space. Sometimes dining services is on board, but they just don't have the space. Um, and if that's the case, try to explore alternative options. So where else on campus is there a kitchen that's not being utilized at all hours of the day? Maybe that's a nutrition lab or even a Greek life house. Um, so little waste. Sometimes, you know, we need to explore alternative food donors. So certain dining providers claim that they have little waste. and um, if this seems to be an issue, try to identify where else on campus or in your community food waste occurs. Maybe there's a catering company on campus or even a local grocery store. Um, so another challenge might be, you know, added time and effort for dining. So supporting a campus kitchen can be a form of added work for them, but that's why we encourage schools to follow a consistent operations schedule on off hours when regular dining operations will not be affected. Okay, moving on to student support. Uh, at the center of each campus kitchen are our students, because really without them, none of this would be possible. While school and dining services are, support are crucial, students should always be at the core of both daily operations and big picture guidance for a campus kitchen. So fostering vast student support during the beginning stages of the affiliation process will allow the process to run that much more smoothly. Um, students are the base for everything at a campus kitchen, so recruit students at all levels of involvement because there's opportunities for everyone in staffing and volunteering and daily operations. Um, and then our leadership team structure. So the LT will be the group of students leading the affiliation and the active ki campus kitchen once affiliated. Um, and students on the leadership team should bring a multitude of diverse skills and interests to the table and will be the main drive behind a campus kitchen because they'll take an active role in everyday activities as well as leading the growth of a campus kitchen. So how to pitch it. Some students might need service hours for graduation or Greek life involvement. So target the youth groups initially and explain that this is a great volunteer experience that can be um, one-time or consistent, depending on their level of interest. And job skills for the future. As I mentioned before, um, we really develop student leaders. Um, so in the past academic year, actually, 67% of our students agreed that participating in campus kitchens has influenced their career path. So those are future leaders that this experience creates because managing volunteers, scheduling, and community involvement, these are all components of running your own nonprofit on campus that will create a unique job skills um, for your future. 
Okay. And then a service learning experience. Experience learning can be done outside of the class, can only be done outside of the classroom. And we'd like to think that the best place for it is in the kitchen, where food is a common denominator with the fight against hunger is the mission. Um, because when your hunger fighter your impact on the community is so much greater than your typical volunteer experience. And there's a lot of value in this, as I mentioned earlier, some student leadership skills um, and generation raised on service. So this is really the first generation raised on the concept of service. And so I think you should capitalize on that experience as so many of your peers value contributing to your experience in a positive way. Um, so I would reach out initially as next steps to other clubs on campus that might be um, have aligned interests with the campus kitchen. Um, and some challenges you might encounter are motivating student volunteers. You'll need to be consistent volunteer, have a consistent volunteer base for your campus kitchen. And sometimes that's challenging in the beginning, um, but it will come with name recognition. And seeking out dedicated student leaders, um, I think, can be hard because finding the right individuals to invest their time can be difficult if you know a student wants to contribute to their community and dedicate their time, but maybe is too busy. Um, but you should really be looking for the volunteers and leaders, potentially, as I mentioned, that ha are already in existing clubs and organizations. So try recruiting through them. Um, or even nutrition classes or social change classes. Um, I think another challenge that you can find when trying to recruit students is often the most passionate students are also the overcommitted ones. So ensure that your student leaders are just as serious about their involvement in campus kitchens and their activities on and off of campus. Okay, so lastly, uh, community support. So don't try to reinvent the wheel is the first thing that I would say. Expanding on partnerships that already exist is a wonderful way to start a campus kitchen. Um, and we also want to ensure that a relationship between a campus kitchen and community partners is reciprocal, where each group benefits from the other in different ways. Um, when looking for potential partners to serve your meals to, keep in mind that this is a mutually beneficial idea. So, for example, um, a boys and girls club after school snacks, that partnership might already exist, for example, with you know an interested student that is involved. Um, so try to seek out those relationships that already exist between your town um, and your campus. So how to pitch it. Um, funding going to mission, not meals, so saving money for an organization. Um, partnering with a campus kitchen is beneficial for organizations because the money that would have otherwise gone to feeding can now go to their actual mission. And creating a community relationship. So expanding the reach of their organization beyond student volunteers and their clients, larger partnerships like these can create a larger network to expand the reach of an organization and get the word out about their mission and their work. Um, also, another additional added value is mitigating gaps in service. So where is the need that is not being met? Perhaps an organization is only able to provide meals on weekdays. So that's where the campus kitchen could come in and serve on the weekends and fill in that gap in service. Um, going beyond the meal, like I mentioned earlier, service going further than free meals. So we don't just deliver food. Our students create unique pro programs for their service um, in their community that address the underlying root causes of food security and poverty. And then asset-based development, I went over that earlier too, but CKP prides itself in being a community-focused program. So every campus kitchen fully assesses their community and identifies already existing assets that they can utilize for their campus kitchen partnership. And lastly, I think our students say it best, um, in the 2014 to 2015 academic year, 100% of our students feel that they've contributed in a valuable way to their community. So I think that community tie is also an added value. But some challenges that you might encounter, um, finding an organization that you can provide and vice versa. So it's crucial to fill an existing need in the community, but also just as much be sure that the services the campus kitchen can provide will actually be useful to the organization. Um, this should be a reciprocal partnership that I, as I mentioned, where everyone is benefiting. 
And establishing new partnerships can also be difficult, um, maybe cold calling and researching where the actual need is. So if you're trying to find a new organization that is in need in your community, establishing those partnerships can be tricky. But don't forget this is a great opportunity for both parties to create a meaningful partnership. Um, and lastly, scheduling. So sometimes the busy college student life um, does not align with the ideal drop-off times for organizations, but this can be easily worked around through delivering cold meals for another day's consumption. So those might be some general challenges, but I would say next step for gaining community support is reaching out to students and seeing where those relationships might be. So as I said, you know, if a student volunteer is already at an organization in the community, or talking to your service learning office, because typically those more formalized partnerships um, exist within that office as well. So now that you have some general information about planning and gaining support, I'm going to hand it over to Matt to talk more about the grant competition in particular and qualifying for that. Great. Thanks, Olivia. Um, like Olivia said, my name is Matt Schnarr. I'm the Expansion and Partnerships Manager at the Campus Kitchen Project. And now that you have a really good overview of kind of um, the basic pieces that need to be in place to have a really strong Campus Kitchen, I want to talk a bit about um, a really awesome opportunity that we have every semester um, to help fund uh, not only the planning of your Campus Kitchen, but then the ultimate uh, implementation of the program as well. Um, so this semester, our launch grant competition is hosted uh, or sponsored by the Sodexo Foundation. Um, and a little bit of background about what these type of grants look like. Um, so it's a bit of a non-traditional grant process where instead of a uh, formal grant application, uh, we do a week-long voting, uh, video voting grant competition where um, schools that qualify uh, submit a video um, and then try to get out as many votes as possible in their, on their campus and their community. Um, and then the top three schools with the most votes at the end of the week each receive a $5,000 startup grant. Um, and like I said before, these grants are not are really ideal for schools that are kind of at the beginning to middle phases of their planning, where they might just have their um, a few folks on board, but are looking to get uh, those other stakeholders on board. Um, but none of the actual um, logistics and planning need to actually be done by the time you participate in the grant competition. But it's really ideal for those that need to continue to flesh out their planning after they can receive uh, they receive a grant. Let's go to the next slide. Great, and so um, it's pretty simple to actually qualify for the, the voting competition. They basically need five things, um, and these will line up pretty nicely to what you have just seen Olivia go over, but basically what we need to see is that there is the foundational support from each of those groups um, is in place. So they, they have given their initial kind of sign off um, that they would want to support a Campus Kitchen program. So the first thing of that would be um, support from your staff sponsoring office. So like Olivia said, finding that key staff person or that key department or office on campus that's going to support um, uh, and kind of be the home base for your Campus Kitchen program. Um, so whether that be the Office of Service, Service Learning, um, or a department, you'll need to get a formal letter of support from them um, for one part of this qualifying process. Um, the other piece is the letter of student support. So this can uh, kind of show in multiple ways. One, it can be either the, the, the group of students that you've pulled together to kind of be on your planning leadership team can write a letter. Um, it can be a letter from an existing club or organization that's going to um, kind of be the umbrella organization for your campus kitchen. It can also be a, a letter from you know a class that you might be working with. Uh, basically, this is showing that you have student interest um, for the program and you have key student leaders that are going to be helping with the planning process and getting it to, um, to the launch of the program. Um, thirdly is a letter of support from Dining Services. Um, like Olivia said, um, this is a letter basically showing that um, dining is able to um, allow for recovered food to be recovered from their um, operations and also that space can be used to store and prep the, that food. So in some cases, as Olivia mentioned, it's not always going to be housed um, in in the dining services kitchen. So with this letter, um, you know, if it is all going to be with dining, that's great. You can have one letter, but if not, this would be a letter from your food donating food donation partners and, and a letter from you know the kitchen space that you're going to be using. Um, so that might be a combination of a few things, but having um, a written letter of support from those explaining those two components is what's necessary for that piece. Um, and then finally, from the for the written components. Um, we, uh, every Campus Kitchen that 
that joins our network um, signs a contract and license agreement with um, our organization to be an affiliate of our program. And so what that means is and, uh, that every school gets their administrator, administration and legal team to review um, the agreement and edit it if they feel like they need to change a few things um, to comply with that agreement. Um, and they, so for this process, to be able to actually qualify um, and be, for us to be able to give you a grant before we actually start the program, we need to have um, that agreement reviewed by those administrators and um, potentially by the legal, school's legal team. So basically pre-vetting um, your school that if you won one of those grants, you'd be able to sign the contract right away. Um, so this process might take a little bit of time, but this is basically, again, reviewing the template that we have for our contract and getting into the right hands of, uh, to the appropriate administrator, reviewing that, potentially editing that, um, and then um, that signing that letter of intent that they'd be willing and able to sign our contract when, they, when and if they received a grant. And so those are the four kind of written components. And then the only other piece to um, actually participate in the grant competition is your video submission for, for the voting. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about more about that specifically in a bit. So we go to the next slide. So why is, are these grant competitions beneficial? Um, I think obviously you can see that just the money itself can be really helpful in um, in the continued planning of, of your of your program, but also just for the general sustainability of the program, having some money that can basically self-fund um, the campus kitchen right off the bat is really uh, a great thing, I think, to, to walk into the walk into with. Um, so the money itself is wonderful, but there's a many other benefits I think that we've seen and our schools have seen um, that they've been able to have by participating in this competition. Um, so by you, as you can imagine, when you are getting folks to vote for your video, um, you're really basically garnering support um, for your future volunteer base, for your future donors, for your future partners. Um, you're actively engaging all of those groups right off the bat and letting them um, start to understand what your Canvas Kitchen is, what who your partners are, what you'll be doing with the Canvas Kitchen, and it's a really awesome way to get people on campus and in the community really excited um, about your future program, but also just to have them be aware of what you are going to do is um, really an amazing asset for our program before it even begins. Um, so again, this, this really helps with that name recognition of, you know, when people hear about you, when your Campus Kitchen actually is starting, they're going to remember that they voted for that video and they saw your video and they saw the need that you're trying to address and be more willing to probably be engaged with the program once it's started. Uh, so people really use it as a promotional tool in a lot of ways to get that initial base of support um, from their campus and community. Um, a lot of times also having this, uh, the grant and the money itself is a great way to help really convince some staff or maybe administration to really buy in to this program because they might have they might be skeptical about funding um, a program or what the cost may be, but I think having this grant um, again, like I said, from the very beginning is a great way to kind of push people forward um, and to really convince them about the value of, of the program. Um, and and it, along that same line, this is a great way to set a clear timeline um, for your planning. I think there are obviously a lot of pieces to the planning process, and like Olivia said, it's not always linear or not always happening simultaneously, or a lot of things can happen simultaneously, um, which can be a little difficult sometimes to kind of plan out how to move forward, but this provides a really clear goal uh, and date that people that you would need to have that foundational support in place. Um, and the great thing is about these grants is you're not doing any extra work that you wouldn't necessarily be doing if you weren't applying for the grant, but just rather just uh, you know starting your the planning of your campus kitchen because all of these pieces, um, the, the, these those uh, foundational support pieces that we just talked about that you need to get the letters for. You'd be you'd be getting anyways even if you were not applying for a grant. So it's just a great way to kind of keep the momentum up and really push forward um, towards a certain timeline and due date. Um, and like I said, yep, engaging with the future volunteers and the name recognition and bringing in new partnerships. So yeah, there really is, an, an, and the great thing is, and we can say that every single, we've done many of these competitions over the last few years and because of the added effects and the added bonus of beyond just the money but of, of that kind of en engagement piece, every Campus Kitchen, whether they've received a grant or not, have ended up launching their program because of the great support that they've seen from this competition. Go to that slide. Um, and so here is actually the actual timeline. And I think this is really great because you guys um, are at a perfect time, I think, to really capitalize upon um, this, this grant competition this semester. 
So the letters of support, the four letters that I uh, went over, those are due on April 3rd. Um, so you, again, you have you know, two months to really start going through and, and, and uh, talking to the various stakeholders. Um, the video that I'll talk a bit about more in a second, um, that's going to be due April 17th. And then the actual voting competition is the week, the first week of May, May 1st through the 8th. Um, but again, the, the great thing to, to think about here when you're looking at timeline is you, through, if you do receive a grant, you are not required to actually start or launch your program um, until as late as November 30th, 2017. So you really have a six-month bubble there to continue the planning, figure out all the logistics, you know, really solidify all the partnerships. And so by, by working towards this grant, um, you really are looking at launching your program probably um, could be as late as next fall. Um, obviously, you can launch any time before then if you're ready to go, but just know that if the, the timeline, just because you're applying for this grant this semester, doesn't mean that you need to have everything together in terms of the logistics until perhaps even as late as November. So moving forward, um, we'll talk a bit about the video because that is a really a key thing to be successful in these competitions is doing well, obviously, in the, the voting competition. Um, so these videos um, are very simple. They're three minutes or less. They basically tell the story of why your community or campus needs a campus kitchen and then how that campus kitchen is going to meet that need. So basically it's going to highlight all the stakeholders, highlight the issues, um, and highlight kind of the solution that the campus kitchen will bring. So that's why you can do that by you know, interviewing students or other stakeholders and campus and community members, you know, giving facts about your community and statistics about your community need, um, and just showing how and why this program is necessary is really the best way. Um, and again, remembering that this video is not only to be used for this competition, but really can be used to promote your future program. So thinking about what resonates with your campus and your audience best. Yeah, if we want to take a look at, actually I don't know if this will show sound. I don't. So this is an example of one of the videos that sound is apparently not working, but we can, um, if you're interested in seeing examples of videos, we can obviously send those over, so please just reach out to us at any time. We, you can, we can show you a variety of examples of the types of videos that have been successful in the past. I'll keep going through that. Great. Um, and so I, I think I talked a bit about this, about this a bit, but how the actual competition works is the week of the competition, and this is a picture from a past competition, um, all the schools that have um, qualified by submitting the letters and the video, um, we, you, we will post your video on our voting page on our website, um, and you'll receive a direct link to your page and to the voting page, and then basically you are um, to ask all of your, you know, the students and your family and friends and campus and community members to go to that page and vote for your video um, once a day. And so you can vote for each video once every 24 hours and you can see there's a leaderboard on the page and we will, um, that keeps tallies of all of the votes. And at the end of the week, that's those, the three schools with the, the most number of votes um, will each receive those grants. It's a really simple process and really just relies on you guys getting out the vote um, as best you can, which I'm going to talk about a bit more about um, right now. So go to the next slide. Um, so again, the, the way to be one of those top three is really capitalizing upon all the outlets and the audiences that you have within your community and campus. And I think oftentimes people may think uh, that because they're part of a small school that they won't be as successful, but we have seen big schools, small schools, high schools do really well in these competitions if they know how to work um, the various audiences that they have. So social media, first and foremost, is obviously a great platform um, to get the word out to a really large audience. So being sure to engage on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all those things um, with, with, in, with your following, with uh, your school's following, um, that is the, probably the best way to get out uh, the vote most broadly. Um, there's also ways to do things on campus by um, you know, working and looking at what networks you, you already have. So the best way, obviously, is tapping into any existing network that you or your school might have. So working with your school's uh, media or PR department to see if they can get out um, if you have a daily email that goes out to your student body or an email that goes out to staff and faculty or an email that maybe even goes out to alumni, um, that's a great way to be able to easily put the link to your video and voting page there and get out to you know, tens of thousands of people automatically. 
Um, even doing in-person uh, advertising on your campus is great. Tabling or chalking or putting it in your school newspaper or putting it in even your community's newspaper um, or even going to big classes and making announcements um, on campus is a really great way to get people excited. So thinking about this is really thinking big about getting you know, other clubs and organizations and classes and even going out into the community and, and talking to um, community organizations or agencies or um, or associations that might want to support you um, in this in this effort. Um, so again, the more people you can can get uh, the word out to, the better of a chance you will be you'll have to receive one of those grants. Um, so now I'm just going to go through really quickly. If we're looking at starting kind of today, if you were starting kind of from the very beginning, what and, and Olivia has gone through the logistics, but let's talk really quickly through what would need to happen and what this needs to look like to kind of keep you on track. Um, so as we go into February, um, if you and and you know if you're starting again from totally ground zero, you would need to start reaching out to some students or student groups to, that are going to want to lead this planning process. And Olivia gave some great examples and there's some more resources on our um, planning tool online that'll help with this also need to reach out, reach out to your potential staff sponsor to see if you can get them to sign on to the sponsoring office. Um, and once those have you've completed those two things, it's, um, unless you have already have a connection to dining, it's good to have those two things set. And then as a team, go together and try to set up a meeting with dining services, obviously, uh, ideally the director or general manager, um, just uh, to talk to them about their the likelihood that they'd be able to partner with you at the various capacities. So that needs so kind of Feeling out those and doing some of those initial meetings and outreach during February is, is, is going to be key. And then moving forward, um, when we get into March, it's going to be really important to solidify some of those pieces. So get the, the sponsoring office to really solidify um, their support through a letter um, of support. Um, and, and once that's happened, utilize them as kind of a springboard to start some of the conversations with administration about the letter of intent. Um, like I mentioned before, the letter of intent, which is reviewing our contract agreement. So getting the sponsoring office to maybe help filter that up to the appropriate people um, within your administration. And then also have continued conversations with dining to really detail out the partnership and what that can look like and get their support or look into other alternative either kitchen spaces or food donors if they're not going to be able to support both of those things. And then ideally by the end of March, you'd be, we'd be able to receive any edits to the letter of intent that might come back from administration so we can work back and forth with those if that needs to be. And then moving forward. Um, at that point, when we hit the beginning of April, ideally you'd be able to submit your letters, be able to submit your letter of intent with any edits, um, and then obviously that by early April and then by mid-April, submitting your video component. And then, um, like I said before, just a reminder. Oop, I think there was. Oh, I guess I didn't put that in there. But just as a reminder, um, again, then the competition would be early May. Um, and you wouldn't actually actually have to launch your program in theory until the end of November. Um, so I'm more than happy, or we're both more than happy to work with you all individually to kind of set a specific timeline, but that's, a, I think, a good way to look at moving forward what needs to be taking place in each of the months um, before the actual competition. Um, so it might seem like May is kind of a far, far away, but in a lot of ways, um, I think this is the perfect timing to start right now to start getting some of those, those bigger pieces in place. Um, and I do think, again, we've heard this from many schools, the great thing about the competition is oftentimes this might be these getting this foundational support and these big pieces are sometimes the more difficult the tasks involved and once you have those things um, solidified and then you're able to do the competition and you really garner a ton of support then the rest of the planning process goes by pretty easily because you have all this already in place um, so like uh, we said if you have any questions at all um, about the planning process or about our planning tools um, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us in, or go to our website uh, which is www.campuskitchens.org, um, yeah, um, and you can find a way to uh, sign up for our online planning tool and, and really be able to flush out a lot of the things that we have um, presented for you today. And so with that, it's going to end the info session. Um, but again, feel free to reach out anytime with questions. Thanks. Thank you.